All right. Can you believe it? Oh my goodness. This is the last day of our summit. Um, a little bit of sad, um, also a little relief for me on the like management end of everything. <laughs> um, but it has been like so amazing and I have loved connecting with you and, um, just really hearing what the speakers have been bringing into your life. So many of you have been putting what they've been saying into practice like immediately. And, and that is so amazing. You are here to be your best self. And, um, and you guys are doing that. And that is so, so amazing. And I hope you see those rewards as well. Um, so I have been asked by several people if I would extend the availability of the replays. So I'm going to do that through Sunday um, at midnight. And then and also that's going to extend our prize entries as well through Sunday at midnight. Um, and then I will post all of the free gifts from all the speakers in one post in the Facebook group. And I will also post all of the replays in one post as well. So you can see all the links, um, the airport giveaway and the final summit prizes. And that's like um, the signed parenting books by two of our speakers um, by Dr. Laura Markham and by Karis Kimmel Murray. Um, those are signed copies and then the toddler books and the snuggle buddies from Suzanne Tucker um, with Generation Mindful. So those will all be announced live then on Monday after we close up in the Facebook group. So today for our last day, a very special um, appearance with Avito, and she is a mindful parenting coach and imperfect mom of four little spirited gurus. She is dedicated to helping you be the loving parent you most want to be. Avito has an audience from all around the world. She has been published in HuffPost and is endorsed and recommended by leaders in the parenting space, including Dr. Shafali and Dr. Laura Markham. She has helped thousands of parents through courses and memberships and hundreds and thousands through her blog. So we are going to get Avital up here on the screen and I am so excited to have her speak to you today. Hi Christine. Hi everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Yes, I'm so excited. Hi everyone. So yeah, should we dive right in? Talking about Let's toddlers. do it. Okay, fantastic. Yes. So Christine invited me here today to talk about toddlers and play. And my main work in the world, one of the big things that I talk about as a parenting coach is the importance of play and, uh, and independent play specifically. So often when I talk about play, parents think, oh no, yet another chore for me to do. And I want to just start by um, kind of laying out the balance around what my personal belief around how much we need to play with our children and how much they need to play by themselves. It's a, li a little understood, but very important uh, and liberating fact, especially for parents of toddlers. Um, so the reason I want to say this is because I think there's a ton of guilt. I mean, let me know in the chat. Just let me know. First of all, say hi and let me know where in the world you're from, <laughs> how old your children are. Um, but let me know if you ever feel guilty that your child constantly wants attention from you, especially if you've been on lockdown and you just can't always give it to them. You have a million other things to do or you just don't feel like playing or some types of play are just not interesting to us adults. We don't want to pretend and we don't want to sit and build, etc. Right. So the reason I'm saying that is because I think there's become there's there has been established collectively in our minds this expectation that parents have to play with their children and that we're their primary uh, source of socializing and their primary source of teaching and their, uh, their best friend and that they need that constant interaction. And I think it's absolutely true that we need to connect with our toddlers, that they need our attention from time to time that they need sometimes when we are there for them. You know, Dr. Laura Markham, you mentioned, she calls this special time. Hand in hand parenting calls it special time when we're focused and that we're with our toddlers. Um, however, the idea that we need to play with them, play for them, is actually a bit of a double-edged sword. Because when you play with a child, what usually happens is that adults come in and they use the play as, a, as an opportunity to teach, right? You're doing this wrong. No, that's the red one. Don't call it blue. This is, you know, a princess. This is a night we start trying to enrich their vocabulary and to teach them and to tell them how to do it. And what very quickly happens is that we overpower children's internal imagination, their innate 
drive to create their own worlds. Because guess what? You're much more developed. Your imagination is much more developed. Your fine and gross motor skills are much more developed. Why would they do it? Why would they get into a world of play? Why would they start creating when you can do it for them? It's just so much easier. And if you continuously come in and do it for them, and then eventually they will not do it for themselves. They will not play. Now that is a shame because first of all, it creates an, a crippling dependency on you. It's just too much for any one of us to be the primary source of entertainment for another human being 24 seven. It's, it's, it actually creates resentment in our relationship. We feel burnt out. We feel exhausted. We feel irritated, like take this child from me. I need a break, right? So it's actually not very good for our relationship. Um, but furthermore, it's also really not very good for our kids because our kids need, they need the capacity, the ability, the time to sink into their own world, their imagination, their, uh, their immersive world. Play is where kids learn. And I mean kids from the earliest of ages, babies, toddlers. That's where they learn. That's where they do. It's like therapy for them. Play is a form of therapy. It's healing. Um, and so if we are constantly overpowering and powering them and not making the space to let them play independently, we're actually robbing them of something very important in their childhood. And that's not to add to our guilt. We already feel guilty enough as it is. Every parent does. But it's just to actually liberate you and to say, no, that's not actually your job. Janet Lansbury uh, quotes Magda Gerber, the founder of the Rye philosophy, and talks about the fact that play is children's job. It's not our job. And she actually talks about the fact um, that adults actually interfere with play. We actually disturb it. We think we're doing them a favor. We're giving them attention. We're being so kind. We're being so connected. But in fact, we're actually taking away something that's incredibly important for them to have on their own terms and on their own. So if you're with, with me so far, just give me a yes in the comments and we'll carry on. Okay, so I, I guess the first thing that I want you to take away from this conversation, and by the way, we'll definitely have time for some Q&A. Okay, I'm seeing some yeses. We'll have some time for some Q&A at the end. I'll leave some time for that. Um, the first thing I want you to take away from it is that play is children's jobs. You do not need to, nor should you play with and for your children connect to them, give them attention, read them books, bathe them, be there with them when you feed them, etc. But do not play for them. Do not interrupt and interfere with their exploration of the world. When they're building with blocks, when they're holding a dolly, when they're cooking something in the pretend kitchen, when they're driving a car, don't get involved. You can appreciate, you can notice, you can reflect back, but don't do it. Don't get right in there because you undermine what they're doing okay so that's the first thing i want to tell you is you can take that job it's one job to take off your to-do list it's not a job that you have to do it's in fact a job that is really solely and wholly in their own uh, domain in their personal domain of development okay so now I want to add another mindset shift for you okay so the first mindset shift was Play is not your job. Play is their job. Do not play with your kids. Do not play for your kids. Do not get involved. And even don't talk to them when they're playing. Don't interrupt them. We try to narrate, oh, you're doing this, you're doing that, right? We're adding all these words. But what I want you to know is that when kids are playing, it is very similar to when you're writing a blog post or a book or when you're reading or when you're uh, immersed in, in the state of flow as Mihai Sinchik Mihai called it, it's a state of flow. It is not a time for interrupting because when you interrupt it, it's very similar to interrupting sleep. You just get a groggy person who didn't, didn't finish the cycle. It's very annoying. Can you imagine if you're sitting there writing your book and someone keeps coming in? Oh, I like how you use that metaphor. Oh, that's a very nice sentence you did just there. It's like, what? Leave me alone. I'm in the middle. <laughs> well, they don't need our praise. They don't, that's not the time for vocabulary building. Vocabulary building is when you're communicating with them around other things in the home. Okay, so let's move on to the second thing that I want to share with you today, which is about the concept that a lot of us face. And let me know in the comments if this is you. A lot of us face a lot of frustration around toddlers specifically, right? Toddlers are constantly... 
um, are constantly, constantly, constantly exploring, right? Their curiosity is, uh, <laughs> is insatiable. They're opening w uh, cupboards, they're emptying things, they're trying to get their fingers in all the wrong places, they're, they're spilling, etc. cetera. And, they're, and a lot of conversations happen online in articles and books around toddler discipline. And one of the big problems with this conversation is a deep misunderstanding of where these behaviors come from. Um, I, this isn't a commentary on discipline or not discipline, but discipline is often a conversation that happens around bad behavior or antisocial behavior, right? Things like hitting, right? Hurting, etc. whatever, calling names, kicking and screaming, doing that kind of thing. The play and exploration that toddlers engage in feels like bad behavior to our adult minds because we know that Tupperware stays in the drawer and that the dirt in the plant pot was not designed to be strewn all over the house. And so to us, that seems like bad behavior. And it feels like we're supposed to correct that, right? And, and, um, and tell them that it's naughty, tell them that it's bad, right? Shout no, no all the time, etc. Put them in the naughty step. But I see all sorts of advice online. The trouble with this is just the deep misunderstanding of toddler's development. And I think one of the things that really behooves us as parents is to learn about childhood development, to simply understand how brains develop, what we can expect from a two-year-old, from a three-year-old, from a four-year-old, etc. right? What is appropriate? Once we know, for example, that tantrums are 100% developmentally appropriate, we can help ourselves get a little bit less triggered by them. We can help ourselves help our child through what is 100% developmentally appropriate, right? When we uh, see, for example, a baby, uh, you know, uh, a three-month-old who can't chew their food, we know it's not developmentally appropriate to expect them to do that. So none of us hold that expectation. We're not getting annoyed that they're not sitting at the table with a knife and fork. However, suddenly when babies turn into toddlers and they learn to walk a little bit and talk a little bit, our minds make a massive jump and start treating them like five or six year olds in our brains. We think they're no longer babies, now they need to know better. So the big shift that I wanna help you here, with here is to learn about the concept of schemas, okay? Has anyone here heard about schemas? Do you guys know about this? I have to tell you, I have four kids. When my eldest was about maybe two or three, I stumbled across uh, I have it open here, nature-play.co.uk. And they had a blog about schemas in children play. And I read it and my, my jaw dropped. It's like, how is this not common knowledge? How is this not something everybody knows about? Because it helps so much when you're a parent of toddlers to understand what schemas actually are. It's just a huge part of childhood development. So uh, allow me to be the bearer of good news in that case. And let me tell you what, and let me tell you what schemas actually are. So schemas are basically just a natural urge that all people have, especially toddlers, okay, natural physical urges to explore certain things. Now, here's something I want you to really get. When, when young children are healthy and are able to explore with their bodies, that is how they learn how the world works. We have a perception that kids learn how the world works primarily through textbooks, being told, uh, you know, conversation, words. It's not true. The primary way that they learn is through feeling it out through their senses, okay? So they learn about wet, uh, wet, dry, hot, cold, big, small, heavy, light, different textures, different properties of the physical world through their physical body. And schemas are basically a set of urges that have actually been deciphered what the urges are, and I'm about to spell them out for you, that all kids or normally and healthily developing kids tend to go through. And we see it and we're like, oh, what is wrong with this child? But what we need to understand is there's nothing wrong with that child. They're doing exactly what they need to be doing. So let me give you some examples just to set this up for you, okay? One schema is the schema of trajectory, okay? So trajectory is the schema of needing to see how things move, okay? Something, throwing something through the air, being swung on a swing, 
right? Dropping something on the floor, throwing balls. Those are all, uh, you know, part of the schema of trajectory. So if you have a child, uh, you know, a two-year-old who's running through your house, throwing things around, you think, oh, what is this wild child? Why is he doing this? What you are missing is that he's exploring the schema of trajectory and through it, he's actually going to learn the laws of physics, right? The law, the laws of various properties, substances, weight, size, etc., speed, velocity, uh, acceleration, incredibly con complex concepts. And when he is in high school and he's actually learning about physics through mathematical equations, it won't just be theoretical. It will make sense in his body because he's experienced the world as such. He, he knows what that feels like. His body is actually trying to teach him that. So instead of saying, no, 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 you can say no about that behavior. Why don't we redirect these types of behaviors like throwing things into something that we can tolerate, okay? Maybe we can tolerate a basket of soft balls or a basket of socks or something, you know, so, uh, an empty basket to throw things into, uh, cars for racing along a track, a box of scarves or tissue paper that you can blow on, uh, maybe having an indoor swing in your house. Um, a place where it's okay to jump, maybe a little trampoline or just pillows gathered together or whatever it is, right? So I got to quickly go, just because our time is kind of short, I'm going to quickly run through some of these schemas so that you get an idea and you can start to notice, oh, my kid is exploring. Usually they're at the at kind of the cross section between several schemas at once, right? Another one is transporting. Okay, we said trajectory, throwing things through the air. Transporting is moving things around, right? You'll notice that often a child will put things, you know, if you have anything with wheels, they like to put something in it and move it from place to place. Uh, putting something in a bucket, in a trolley, in a digger, in a truck, um, moving things around in boxes, right? So those are the kinds of things that are the transporting schema. So if they keep doing that to your kitchen cabinets or whatever, provide them with something that you allow them to do it. An empty, bar, an empty laundry basket, recycled boxes, jars, plastic or paper containers, um, stacking toys, any kind of stacking toys, ice cube trays, uh, et cetera, right? I'm just throwing out some ideas here so that you can, uh, so that you can find um, ways of allowing them to basically dump and refill, right? Through this transporting schema. You know that when you take a toddler to the beach, right? If you've had the great pleasure of being able to do that, um, they will be there for hours. They can play in the sand for hours typically, normally, because they're able to explore so many of these schemas at once, right? Okay, um, rotation. Rotation is the fascination with anything going round and round, okay? It's why kids like to become dizzy. They like to spin around themselves. They like to go on merry-go-rounds. They like to go on, uh, on um, you know, what are they called in the playgrounds, um, right? They like to actually watch things that spin like uh, frisbees or uh, spinning tops, dreidels, the washing machine, <laughs> anything that's to do with that rotation, that's going to be uh, the rotation schema, okay? So again, if you notice that your child is doing that, find ways of allowing them to do that, okay? Exploring circular patterns, baking with you and whisking things, mixing things together, anything that has to do with reels and cylinders and rollers and balls and all of that spinning stuff, okay? All right, another one is connecting. Uh, connecting is anything where we're putting things together or taking things apart. So a typical thing for this would be train tracks, uh, puzzle pieces, uh, sellotape, masking tape, glue, any time that we're connecting. And uh, one of the less, uh, less convenient parts of connecting is disconnecting as well, right? Like taking things apart, the need to see what happens when we take things apart. In closing, um, which I get really confused with enveloping, which is another schema, but basically both of them are to do with closing things in or wrapping things up, right? So you'll notice toddlers like to hide themselves under the sheet, in a blanket, in a scarf, in a silk, right? Um, getting, it, it's a lot to do with also where they are, like under the table, under the chair, in the closet, inside the basket, right? And it doesn't have to be themselves. They like to do this with things too, like taking a handkerchief and putting marbles inside it, etc. cetera. Um, someone's asking, is this age specific? And I'm talking specifically about toddlers, but schemas manifest themselves throughout the years in different ages and in different ways. Um, so, and I think us adults have these urges as well, <laughs> very often. 
Um, another interesting one is positioning. Have you ever noticed your child liking to organize, for example, animals in a certain way or colors in a certain way or blocks in a certain way, right? Deciding that they only want their fork on this side of the plate and not on this side of the plate and they only want the cup on the top but not on the bottom. This is all about positioning. So positioning is caring and sorting and categorizing where things go, right? Making order of the world. Um, and finally, I'll just mention orientation. Uh, orient oh no, two more. Orientation is actually about literally going upside down. So I think this is a really interesting one because you and I probably both know uh, about what it feels like when you change perspective on the world, when you hang upside down, for example, when you look through your feet. And the reason you and I probably know that is because we did it as two-year-olds as three-year-olds, right? Unless you're in a yoga class right now, you might not be doing that that much at the moment, but you have a sense in your body of what that means. Now it's kind of cool because I think all of these have a deeper meaning as well. Teach us something a little bit deeper about ourselves and about the world as well. And orientation, if you wanna take it to a more spiritual level is about shifting perspective, right? Seeing things from a different perspective. So toddlers are often going to try and go upside down, um, you know, on a, trapeze swing or on the monkey bars or climbing walls, any opportunity when they have maybe even a floor mirror, right? Changing perspective and seeing things from a different angle, doing cartwheels, doing roly polies, etc. And finally, I'll talk about transformation. And transformation is about learning about properties and substances and materials. So this is the fascination with mixing sand and water or pouring milk into cereal or mixing the Play-Doh colors, painting. Um, we're learning a lot about, is it liquid? Does it absorb? Does it get soggy? Does it change colors? Does it change temperatures? Does it change consistency? And it's really inconvenient because this is where, you know, they're eating with their hands and they're trying to mix their pasta with the orange juice and all this stuff. Um, but we can cater to that. We can cater to that separately, right? So things like, you know, if you could use a tray and set them up with slime or bar bath bombs in the in the bath or ice cubes in the bath or bubbles right blowing bubbles um throwing ice cubes in a wood stove good example yeah baking baking with you cooking with you anything that you're doing anyway that is going to involve these schemas is a great way uh, of allowing them to explore the world so i guess the main thing that i want you to take away from this section is the idea that when toddlers are being inconvenient, when they're doing all the naughty quote unquote stuff around the house, it's typically to do with a schema, an exploration. It is not naughty behavior. It's not bad behavior. It's not antisocial behavior, but yes, it does need redirection. And no, you don't have to be willing for them to pour milk all over the floor in the kitchen just because they are exploring the transformation schema. You can certainly and must certainly set a limit around it. However, it will give you a clue as to what they're, what it is they're interested in. Oh, you're interested in pouring? No problem. Let me just set up a bucket and give you a jug with water and you can pour to your heart's content. Um, I just can't let you do that with the milk, right? So rather than this being now a power struggle between me and my toddler, it's a problem. Oh, the problem is you're interested in the schema. Uh, we can't do it in this way. And now we can both solve it together and find an alternative way of solving that problem. Now, I would love to open up the last five minutes to Q&A. So if you do have any questions, then please do put them in the chat box and I can start with the one that I see already in there. How's that, Christine? Should we move into yes. Q&A? Okay. Absolutely, go ahead. Okay, great. So I've got one from Jessica here. And if you're joining me on Instagram, just put the questions in the questions tab. Otherwise I will not be able to see them. You need to put them in that question mark box. Um, Jessica, my daughter is 21 months. I want her to play alone, but she wants me there. She is my only kid. When are kids developmentally ready to play alone and how do you do it? Oh, Jessica, that's my favorite kind of question because it's what my whole career is dedicated to. <laughs> Uh, I have an entire, you know, all of my content, a lot of my content is around this. So I, I can't give you all of the answers, but I'll give you some of them. She's absolutely ready 
to play alone. Um, children are ready to play alone from the day that they are born. Babies, uh, when they are fed and rested and have had their attachment time, etc., they are ready to just look around at the world, right? However, in our culture, we get in their face. <laughs> we get in their face all the time. We talk to them all the time. We rattle to them. We think we need to entertain them. We interpret their behavior as being bored. We think our role is to constantly entertain, constantly teach, constantly engage. And so we've actually, by the time a, a child is 21, sometimes we've already taught them out of their natural tendency to be explorers and to to be content in their own skin and capable of entertaining themselves. Okay, now, Jessica, this should not freak you out in any kind of way because 21 months is incredibly young. I have clients that come to me with nine or 10 year olds saying, how do I fix this? My child is so dependent on me. So you're in an absolutely great time to start. And what I wanna say is, that you need to start to honor and realize and notice that your child can and will play by themselves. It's first of all, a parental mindset shift to notice, oh wow, wait, she's just gone over there and she's, she's moving around and she's looking, she's picking stuff up. Hey, maybe this is the beginning of something. We have a preconceived notion that play means whatever it means to you, sitting down and building with blocks or holding a dolly and feeding it with a bottle. I don't know. You have some imagination of what it means. It means so many things. It means exploring the world. It means moving around with my body. It means rolling around on the couch. It means singing a song. It means dancing. It means drawing. There are so many things that she's probably already doing when she crawls around and she looks around and she picks things up or she empties a drawer and she puts it back. Those are the types of things that the first step to do is to not interrupt. The biggest and most profound mistake we parents make is that we are blind to the play that's already taking place. And then we get involved in it and dis we get involved in it and disrupt it and teach our children, teach them. We really teach them that they can't do it by themselves. Oh, let me help you. Oh, I see what you're doing. We get involved. <laughs> we keep getting in there. And when we keep getting in there, we're teaching them that they can't do it by themselves. And we're not honoring the fact that it's already happening. And the second thing is that we need to uh, um, kind of um, wean our babies, toddlers, children off of our direction. We direct them all the time. You're going to direct them when is bedtime, what is for lunch, what are we doing now, get in the car, get out the car, diaper change, etc. You're directing them all the time. The idea with the play is that in this arena, we're not going to direct them. This is something that we're going to 100% hand over to them. And so when they look to you, mommy, do it for me, mommy, play for me, mommy, fix it, daddy, why aren't you with me? I'm bored, I can't do it. The idea is to reflect back warmly, kindly, connectedly, that we trust them, that we believe in them, that we're here to witness them, but not to fix it for them. So minimal, the minimal viable inter, um, you know, interaction in sense of, oh, you know, I can help a little bit. Like I can, I can move this for you over there. Is that what you needed? Great. And then we remove ourselves, right? In other words, not constantly being intertwined. Jessica, does that make sense? Okay. Another uh, question came in. My two-year-old always says, no, mama do it. How do I fix? So if, if that kind of, I've kind of answered that in my previous, in the previous question, but if your child is constantly saying, mama do it, it's okay to sometimes do it. And it's also okay to say no. And the reason that we don't, the reason that we don't hold the limit and say no with our child is because we're afraid of a tantrum. And tantrums are not to be feared, they're to be welcomed. It is absolutely okay to say, you can do it, I'm right here. And if you really genuinely think it's too hard for a child to do, then by all means help them. But the idea is, I believe that we should never help a child with anything that we think they can do on their own. Uh, that is my rule of thumb in my family is, if I know you can do it on your own, you know, barring the, the very rare case that someone's sick and they need extra love and oh, you know, let me just do it for you, right? We all do favors for each other in our family. That's not the point. The point is that just generally speaking, we don't make a habit and a pattern out of me doing things for you that you're perfectly capable of doing your own. If you can fetch your own water, if you can get your shoes on, if you can pull your pants up, you're gonna do it on your own because I'm not here to keep you dependent on me. I'm here to offer you my heart and my love and 
attention and connection, but not dependency beyond what is necessary. That is keeping children small. And so I think it's incredibly important to say, you know, why don't you give it a try or to help very minimally, like to say, oh, I can twist the piece for you to help you get it in, but I'm not going to get it in for you, right? What is the minimal action that you can do to support your child? Like my child will sometimes say, I can't get my shoes on when I know that she can, but I'll say, how about I line them up for you and then you'll get them on right? So what's the littlest thing? And then the other thing is just re, re <laughs> underscoring what I just said, where I said, you can say no with warmth, say, you can do it, darling. I'm here, you know, I'm here and I believe in you and I'm going to watch you. Show me you doing it. And if they cry and they have a tantrum, that is because they needed to cry and have a tantrum. They were, they were looking for, I just have to give an example that I think is so important for people to realize. When one of my children was two uh, or three or whatever, three, I knew that he can get his pants on because he gets them on every single day. And one day he was like, you do it, you do it, you do it. Now, here's the thing. Most parents are going to see that and be like, oh, I can't be bothered for the whining. I'll just do it for him. Right. But what I could see through that is that when your child is asking you for help with something you know they can do or asking you for something they know you're going to say no to, like, can I have candy or can I have TV when you know they're going to say no? It's not because they want that thing. It's because they need an opportunity to let feelings out. They need you to say no. They need you to hold the no so that they can tantrum. And here's what's going to happen. You say, sure, I'll put the pants on for you. Believe me, within two minutes, he's found something else that he can't do. Why? Because he has big feelings inside and they just need to come out. And so I'll stand there and saying, sweetie, I'm not going to put your, your pants on for you. I know you can do that for yourself. I know. I know it's disappointing that I said no. I know. Right? And then he's allowed to let his big feet, he can cry and cry and cry. And then when he's done, he's done and he feels better and he can move on. And so we shouldn't get caught up when our kids say, play with me. It's often that type of thing. They see you're busy. They want you to do it for them. They want you to fix it for It's actually a lot more to do with the fact that they need, they need the boundary to come up again so that they can let the feelings out rather than that they need you to be enslaved of constantly saying yes to everything that they ask for. That's actually not what they're asking for. Don't take what two-year-olds say at face value okay don't take it at face value it is not they just learn how to use language okay they just learnt words <laughs> so they're using the words that they have to mean something very complex and very different but that's not what they mean they don't mean mommy you don't spend enough time with me you don't play with me enough it's not fair you don't give me enough attention. that's not what they mean what they mean is ah, i'm feeling overwhelmed and frustrated right um yeah all three or four a hundred percent it's not just two-year-olds young children in general and many adults that i know behave this way as well okay <laughs> Uh, Christine, do we have time for another couple of questions or should we, should we cut it off here? What do you say? Oh, no, you can keep going. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we have another question. Kids cannot keep their limits with each other. So I'm always interfering with their fights. Okay. Siblings is a fabulous topic. Just to keep this purely to toddlers and play, I'm going to direct you to my latest video that I actually did with Dr. Laura Markham. It's on my YouTube channel and on my Facebook and Instagram. And it's a fantastic uh, summary of helping siblings with their fights. We've got a couple in that series. So I'm going to direct you there. Uh, where can one read more about schemas? That's a fantastic question. I've read primarily online about it. I am writing about it in my upcoming book. It will be coming out in November. Um, but yeah, but I don't actually know of a book about it. So I'm not 100% sure. All right, let me take a few more questions that have come in here. Um, okay. Is or I will take this away from you a good form of discipline? That's a question from Daisy. Um, you know, I think that's a great question, Daisy. Let me just click your question. Okay. Um, I think that's a great question. And I think in some cases, that's just reality, right? That's just a logical consequence. Like if your child is playing with a glass jar and they want to throw it and you say, I need you to give that to me or I'll have to take it away from you. 
perfectly fine in my opinion. Absolutely correct. You know, uh, I think the, the way to cipher if something is a good form of discipline is, am I doing this to get back at my child? Am I doing this to seek revenge or to show them who's boss or to put them in their place or to make them suffer? Or am I doing it because I need to maintain order in our home and I need to maintain safety and health and respect for people and property, right? So just check in with yourself, but, or I will take this away from you. It's just the truth. And, I, and you do need to mean that if you're going to say that. I often take things away from my kids. If they're disrespecting property or people, it's if I can't see you using that respectfully, I'll need to take it away from you. Simple as that. No, no hesitation necessary in my opinion. I think it's very important. Um, Okay. Um, what if you let them guide the play, asking them what they want you to do? That's a question from Laurie. So Laurie, I think that is great as an interim step. Um, so if a child is fully dependent on you, and also if you want to play, here's a really important thing. If you are playing with your child, but in your mind, you're like, oh, I don't want to be here. I have a million things to do. This is so boring. Uh, let me organize while I'm playing that's not really playing with them, right? That's not what they really wanted from you. That's not present, that's not connected, we all do it, but let's just be honest with ourselves. The energy matters, the feeling matters. It matters if we're sitting there being like, hey babe, you know, I'm, I really wanna spend time with you. Do you wanna tell me how you want me to build this? Or do you wanna direct me? Or can I be your assistant in the game? That's one thing. But if it's like, fine, I'll play with you and I'll just do it minimally. The child is getting the message that it's okay to accept this begrudging, cold, uh, you know, fine, I have to connection with someone. I personally prefer saying no to my children every day of the week. And then on Saturday say, I have real time to connect with you now. And they know that I'm, I have integrity, that I am authentic. You know what I mean? That if I'm spending time with you, I mean it. Um, and here's the other thing that I want to say is, it's absolutely okay, by the way. I don't use terminology like not okay, yes, okay. You know, it's all okay. These are your kids, this is your relationship. If it feels good to you, it's fine, of course. I just don't want you to let go of the fact that independent play is important, uh, is helpful, is necessary, and is different than directing an adult to do things for you. It has its own massive, that's what my book is gonna be all about, independent play, because we all understand the importance of connection and of being of spending time with our children. What we're misunderstanding is the independent aspect of growth and learning and how it's not uh, uh, adult supervised, observed, measured, qualified, quantified, and involved. And so I just want to say that, yes, play with your children. Absolutely. Do it when you feel like you really want to do it. Do it when you're in a good mood to do it and do it minimally. Like you're saying, like, I'm not going to now tell you how to know you're the mermaid and I'm the pirate and let's do it. No, I'm going to be here as the assistant director, right? You're the director. I'm the assistant director. That's fine. But don't lose sight of the importance of the ability to play alone. If children cannot play by themselves, that is a recipe for parental burnout. Okay, if children cannot play by themselves, that is a recipe for parental burnout. I think we've all seen it during quarantine, right? We've all experienced that to the nines. Um, if you have a child who can play for a few hours a day, you know, interdispersed between meals and naps and everything, but they can play for chunks of time and you can put your feet up and read a book or do the laundry or have a meeting, that's a very different experience of parenting than a child who cannot do that. Um, so that's for you, for the selfish, which is not at all selfish reasons. But for the child, it's also completely different, right? That child realizes that they are, they are creators, they are self-directed, their, their, their ideas matter, that they have agency, that they are capable of creating meaning and interest in their lives, that their inner worlds are important and respected and useful and all of that good stuff. Okay, I know we have a lot more questions coming in. So Christine, I would love for you to, uh, to direct me. Would you like to keep going or should we save some of these for another time? Um, how about you do one more and then we'll wrap up. How does that sound? Okay, guys, so we're going to do one more question and I'd be very happy to continue this conversation um, at another time. Okay, let me, just, uh, let me just find some great question. Um, okay, what are some words to say when I need her to play on her own, but she's upset that I won't go with her? Okay, so some words to say. Great. How about something like, 
Oh, honey, I can see you're disappointed. I do need to finish cooking dinner now. Um, so why don't you decide what you want to do at the moment? You know what we have in the house. We have the art supplies and the toys, etc. And if you'd like to bring something near me, that's fine. But I'm going to be cooking right now. Right. So just something that's really warm, but really clear. No, I'm not available to play. Yes, I see you and I love you. Um, you have the options and you don't want to overwhelm, especially two year olds with options. Right. I would in that case. Sorry, I was being maybe to a bit of an older child, but to a younger child, it would just be like putting something out on the floor, you know, bringing the blocks there or bringing a doll there and continuing about your day, right? Um, and that's the place where you need to feel uber confident that it's absolutely fine, necessary, desirable, healthy to say no. Uh, not in the way of no, but just saying you can play now. And, it, and the thing is that I feel zero guilt when I do that because I know that playing independently is my children's birthright. It's all children's birthright. It's what they were born to do. It's what all baby animals do. Cubs play. That's what they do. They know how to do that. They know how to explore the world. Our children do as well. They're just being socialized out of it. And so it's not a rejection of them. It's not a, an abandonment of them. It's actually a gift to them. And the even bigger gift beyond or bigger, whatever, bigger, smaller, whatever. An additional gift is that they get a happier parent. And if they realize that they would make that trade every day of the week. So if you know that you have to do something like, oh, you know what? I actually want to read this chapter right now. So I'm not available to play. Or I need to write, you know, write this thing or um, have, <clears throat> have this phone call or make dinner or whatever it is, clean the house. And you can be super duper confident. You're running your home. You're running your business. You're running your job. You're running your self-care, whatever it is. Those things are important. They are more important than you sitting on the floor and playing every time you're being summoned to. Um, they're actually more important, just toddlers can't see it because they have a different set of priorities, which is why we have the fully uh, developed adult brains and they don't. So you can feel incredibly confident, incredibly calm about that, uh, incredibly um, proud that you're setting firm limits, that you're making your expectations clear and that you're making space and time for your child to develop their own skills. Now, the last thing I just want to leave you this, with is this. There is a threshold that we need to overcome whenever we're establishing a new habit or a new skill. If your toddler is used to you constantly being there, constantly answering every question, playing with them, etc., it will take two, three days, a week, two weeks, I don't know, depends on how you do this, of tantrums, right? Or of reactions when they say, come and you say, honey, actually, I'm going to be doing this now. So the answer is no, right? And you set them up with something, right? You get out a toy, you put something on the floor, you show them how they could get started, but you don't stay there. They might whine, they might, they're used to something, right? But this is the weaning process when you wean a child off of breastfeeding or off of a, a, a diapers or off of a, you know, a pacifier. There's always a threshold of resistance, right? That we have to push through. Most parents don't push through. And therefore, they stay in the dependency phase. They stay with that power struggle and they burn themselves out, right? They say, well, my child just doesn't. My child just won't do it. Your child will do it. You just have to be willing to go through a few uncomfortable days where you establish a new expectation. And guess what? Kids' brains are so plastic, so adaptable, so adjustable. Toddlers, wow, they can adjust to any new reality you throw their way. Absolutely, they can learn to be independent players. But you do need to get them through that initial threshold of resistance. And you need to stay firm and clear in your expectations. So that is my strong recommendation is to really ground yourself there and to, and to quote unquote, push through or breathe through um, those uncomfortable first few days where you're like, oh, oh, will this ever end? Yes, it will. You'll establish a new behavior and you'll start learning. You know, I invite you to all of my stuff and all of my materials and you'll start learning uh, new ways. I have a childhood design guide that I think Christine is putting up in her resources. Um, it's free. It will help you establish your play space, wherever that is, however big or small your house is, and the types of toys that you need, the types of, uh, the types of environment that support independent play versus those that don't. So all of that we can help you with. But the mindset has to be there that my child can and will, and with my support and with my belief, we will get there <laughs> for all of our benefits. 
Yes, thank you so much, Vito, for speaking to us. I really appreciate it. Um, we are going to post your um, free gift, the 10 Easy Steps to Transform Your Home into a Play-Induced Haven. Um, we're going to put that up for you later today. And um, thank you again. Um, where can everybody stay in touch with you? I know you're on Facebook and Instagram, and, and you've got podcasts and all that kind of stuff. So where, what are they looking for? Just the Parenting Junkie. Uh, you'll find the, uh, on Instagram, it's at Parenting Junkie. Everywhere else, it's Parenting Junkie or theparentingjunkie.com. Uh, you'll find my podcast, my YouTube, my Facebook, and my courses as well. So, yeah, awesome. you're, very much, you're very much invited. Very nice. All right. Thank you again so much, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. This was our last day of the summit. And um, like I said, we will get all those prizes and everything wrapped up this weekend. So, thank you so much. Bye. Bye, guys.